All right, I'm going to three, two, one, boom. Good conversations are taking place around reducing bias and increasing diversity in tech hires. But real change happens when infrastructure is implemented and executed within an organization because, hey, action speaks, right? Our guest is an experienced infrastructuralist, and he has the studies and results to show how tech companies can positively change hiring practices. Plus, he's got a whole bunch of amazing startup stories to share with us. Stay tuned, everyone, for the Startup Life Live show. Let's glow. Woohoo! Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Startup Life Live Show. I'm your host, Andy Lyons, four times founder and startup champion to founders around the world. And after raising four businesses of my own, I now share founder startup stories to help newly minted business owners find the solutions and inspiration they need to succeed. And I am thanking you personally for showing up and upping your founder game, carving out the time to improve your founder skills while cheering on another founder, because as you do better, your business will do better. You never know, a new resource, tool, solution, you can find something every time you tune into the Startup Life Live Show that can help you and your business grow and glow. And if you're joining us live or via replay, please say hello in the comment thread so I can give you a virtual hug. And if you're tuning in from YouTube and you haven't done so already, please share your subscribe love and a click on the bell icon for alerts. And thank you for sharing your like love wherever you're watching this video. We're live right now on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and Facebook, <laughs> five platforms. And you never know when you hit that like button, it goes out into your feed and it could help a founder out there maximize the joy and minimize the heartache from their founder journey. And how do you know whenever we post a new show and have another amazing guest on the show, like our guest today, you join our Startup Life Live meetup group. And I'll have the link in the show notes for my podcast listeners. And those of you watching, you can scan that QR code, go to bit.ly backslash Startup Life Live and join the fun of getting alert whenever a really interesting, fascinating, like our guest today is joining us. Um, also, if you resonate with the show's mission of amplifying diverse founder voices, then hey, reach out to me, okay? Because there's a way through sponsorship that we can create greater impact on the startup ecosystem through your sponsorship dollars. So I'd be so grateful. There it is. You saw it right there, Andy at andylyons.com. And one more thing. Did you know that you can listen? I'm always talking about the podcast listeners, right? You can listen to the show. It's not always so easy to do a video, tune into a video. So you can subscribe via iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you uh, listen to podcasts. So I'm so excited to introduce you to our guest because he's really a phenomenal founder. And it's the oh so amazing Everett Harper. And Everett is co-founder of Trust, where for 10 years they've been helping startups scale and large enterprises and public agencies transform from legacy to modern systems. And Trust made its name by helping to save healthcare.gov. And since then, they've worked with massive health data systems, major transportation and logistics systems, and several companies with data science specializations. And Everett's expertise is in customer development, a technique that combines customer behavior with ethnography to inform product and business development. He has an MBA and a master's in ed in design and technology from Stanford and a BSEE in biomedical and electrical engineering from Duke. I got to tell you folks, I'm wearing my smarty pants today <laughs> so I can grab <laughs> every bit of brilliance from this amazing guest. Welcome to the show, Everett. I'm so happy to have you. Hi, thank you. And thanks for all the folks who are listening live and who are going to be listening um, on replay. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to your space. Excellent. And you know, our community manager right here says that we're sounding all good Excellent. and clear. Thank you, Asia, Asia K. And Brent is tuning in and saying hi from Ottawa, Canada. Thank you so much for that. And I know there's several folks who are tuning in while they're doing other things right now. We're so grateful for your presence. And speaking of being grateful, what are you feeling really grateful for today? For me? Um, yeah. 
I am feeling grateful for um, Dia de los Muertos, um, that festival um, where people are remembered in celebration with families. I was just in Oaxaca, Mexico, able to have that experience uh, direct, and it was warm, it was wonderful, and I'm Aww. very grateful for being able to be able to participate in that. Oh my gosh, so tell me a little bit more about how does that work, that celebration of folks who are no longer with us physically? Yeah, yeah, so I'm not an expert, so uh, I may get uh, some details wrong, but essentially, um, similar to Halloween, but uh, right around November 1st and 2nd in Mexico, there's a celebration um, that's often done with families and you build altars surrounded with marigolds. People might have seen the calaveras, which is the skull, um, but it's really a family and community experience where instead of mourning people who have passed, their names and their remembrance is celebrated. And um, being there on site, it was very much um, it was very much that and more. Um, I, I can't express how grateful I am to uh, the folks in Oaxaca and Mexico for being so welcoming and uh, and inviting oh. us to be part of it. I love that. There's nothing better than being able to honor someone, you know, by right. being able to speak their name out loud. That's, That's wonderful. Right. I want to remind our viewers, those who are live and those who will be listening later. This is why you want to show up live. We love to amplify your brand and your work in the world. You can share your URL, your one-liner, your business name, and we'll bring it up onto the screen and celebrate you because we're all you know, trying to move our business forward and increase brand awareness, right? And please feel free to pop any questions into the comment threads even after the show because we're here to serve you and help you with whatever you're working on. And um, so I just want to say hi. Speaking of that, here's a great example. And this is from Laura Qureshi, and she has a phenomenal EEOO uh, extra virgin olive oil mm -hmm. from Turkey. And it's called Zaze, Z A A Z E Y. All women farmers harvest this olive oil in Turkey. She's in Turkey right now, uh, working with the women and saying hi to all of them. And, uh, and so we love always showcasing you, Laura. All right. <laughs> and Suzette Gardner, great to see you. Thanks for tuning in. And I know you're going to love, love, love hearing everything that Everett has to say. But so let's get right into Everett's origin story because you know as founders we all start off and we have different experiences along the way you know you're the son of two what i would almost call self-educated engineers at ibm how did your parents lived experience prepare you for founderhood everett yeah so my parents are from a small neighborhood called homewood in pittsburgh pennsylvania they graduated high school my dad went to the navy my mom uh, became what they called at the time a secretary. Mm -hmm. In the Navy, however, he ran an electronic shop and it was right at the moment in the early 60s when IBM was hiring African-Americans for um, white collar jobs. So my dad became an engineer, became a programmer at the time. And my mom um, went from being a secretary, noticed that, hmm, this is this programming thing might go somewhere and decided to take the courses, pass the courses after some challenges, and had a 30-year career as a programmer in assembly language, which blows some of my colleagues away um, at my company, what she had to do. So how did it fit with, and how did it impact my, uh, my founder journey? Well, first is to pay attention. Um, my mom went from secretary to being a, a programmer because she saw that their market had changed and thought, hey, I want to be part of this, and then worked really hard to get there. Yeah. The second is, and this was a message I heard as a kid, you better respect people at all positions uh, in an organization. Because sometimes the folks at the front of the house know everything that's going on, and they know when they're being disrespected. So yes. being able to make friends, get information, get you into doors. Um, everybody has something to contribute. Hi, and third, love that. And third? and third? People are willing to open doors. My mom was assisted by her manager who had nothing to gain by having her leave the secretarial pool and become a programmer, but he cleared space for her. And that enabled her to step forward and really become the programmer that she wanted to be. And, you know, she allowed that to happen as well. She went after her dreams. She knew and had tapped into her capability 
And she was aligned with someone who said, yes, I want to celebrate you and have you move on. That's a beautiful story. And it's something we all need to remember. We have champions in our lives, right? Yep. Who help us move forward. And so how did that, you know, so that their experience of treating folks with respect and also going into new territory that they may not have thought they were capable of doing, but felt a really strong calling or resonance with and alignment with, and they did it. And they, you know, asked for those opportunities as well. That's and right. so you went on to get your degree in, in a, you know, a tough uh, background of education. Why did you choose that category other than that you were, of course, the offspring of two incredible smarty pants engineers? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, um, for engineering, mm -hmm. I just, cause I was interested in, in kind of building systems that actually help people in, in their health. Yeah. I went to Duke in part because it was one of the first programs in the country. And also I was able to play soccer there and we were able to win, um, a national championship, uh, for the first in Duke's history. Both of those experiences actually influenced my founder journey in the way that I lead and the way that I think about teams and high performance. So those are two very uh, important things. Um, and then getting an MBA was really about kind of furthering my curiosity. Um, and I started in organizational behavior um, as a PhD student, decided I didn't want to be a professor, went to the MBA program. And then MED was learning design and technology. This was the era in 1999 when Palm Pilot had just come out. Yes. How do you think about creating devices? All of that was very, very interesting to me at the time. So that was sort of what pulled me into uh, uh, the educational opportunities I had. Well, and I love that right after undergrad, you went to go work for Bain. Yep. So you got some really good, strong experience there. Then you went back to school mm -hmm. and then you went, I know you had a little bit of a, an entrepreneurial experience during that yeah. time. After. Yeah, that's right. Um, so at the time I was working for the Center for Community Self-Help, Self-Help, which is a community development finance institution, which has done amazing, amazing work uh, to provide more low income and modern income people the opportunity to buy their first homes. They created the first secondary market for that as well. So that was really incredible to be part of. At the time, we were dealing with redlining uh, in many states. And I had the opportunity to take a training to teach people about diversity and inclusion. Um, and I liked it. And so at the side gig, um, which I know a lot of founders out there probably have one or two or several side gigs, um, I started doing these trainings. And I liked it. It was curious. I seemed to be okay at it and it had an impact. So I just kept going and eventually I made it into a full-time business before I went to grad school. And I learned a ton. I still have the first um, sheet that said, hey, we're gonna pay you for this thing, you know? So it's <laughs> it's really kind of funny um, what that what, what that experience was It's like. so much fun when you can ring the bell for the first time someone pays That's you right. for That's a service. Right. And you know, I tell founders all the time, Everett, that, you know, you can start a business and we have this mythology about entrepreneurship being, you know, unicorn status. Right. Folks, if you can you know, feed your family, if you can get a repeat sale for crying out loud, if you can create momentum, um, this is huge. Right. Not many people can actually come up with an idea, launch it and have customers buy again and again, or get more customers into a funnel. So there's huge success in doing that, in my opinion. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'll give you a little stat, and this is for, I just learned this, at Stanford Business School, which highly over-indexes for people who are raising venture capital, only 30% of all the folks who have started businesses have done it through venture capital. 70% have done it through various other means and are growing in sort of a pace that is sustainable uh, and not at a necessarily a unicorn VC uh, space. So that gives some perspective on, uh, oh, yeah. on what you've just said especially since we all are stuck in the impression that you just go to Stanford and you can get money, yeah. you know, it's, uh, and, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we have to remind everybody MailChimp. Okay. Never took institutional money folks. Okay. They bootstrapped from day one and they just, you know, sold for over a billion. They didn't go public, right? They sold. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to, 
nope, left my mind. I thought maybe quicken, but nope, can't remember. But uh, that's important to remember, folks. Bootstrapping, lean machine, all of that. So you came out of with your multiple degrees, master's degrees from Stanford, and mm -hmm. you went back to uh, being on payroll, mm -hmm. and you know, which I just think is amazing and so much fun. What inspired? Hey, folks, there's nothing wrong with a guaranteed paycheck. Side hustles are really good too. Uh, right. What made you want to dive back in in 2009 into the entrepreneurial pool? Yeah, so um, business school, right in the middle of dot com boom. Just be part of it, learn a lot. I was part of different startups at that time and then joined Linden Lab, which was uh, one of the first of uh, virtual worlds. So all the stuff that we're talking about with meta and um, virtual reality, Linden Lab was doing as far back as 2003, and I was part of it from 2007 to 2009. That's very and, exciting. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I <laughs> let's just say I know where the good parts are and where the people are going to run into some challenges, but that's a whole nother story. Um, um, and so I decided after that, I um, wanted to try my hand because I'd learned a lot of things. Um, I paired up with somebody to do a mobile wine app. This was the era in 2009 when apps were all the thing. And I learned both that, A, we could do it. We won a Webby Award for it. Uh, it's called, uh, it was called Bottle Notes. And at the same time, I learned some really hard lessons about get your contracts right. Hire people that you can trust because we had some folks who were doing our engineering who weren't trustworthy. And um, we got burned by that. And so- And how did you get burned by that? that? So what I'm sorry? Did, how did you get burned by that? What did that well, look like? The contract that we were using wrote sort of a shady contract. I didn't really, it kind of one of those situations where you kind of, the sniff test doesn't work, but you really want to get it done. And so I did it. And then the person disappeared. There was all the bait and switch. There was all these things that were happening. And because I was funding it and my partner were funding it ourselves, we felt very trapped by that. We couldn't buy our way out. And so the product was late. It wasn't up to spec. And while it had a lot of success, it wasn't what we were really looking for. Right. Um, and then we decided, mm, maybe this will go to a different direction. That's right, folks. You got to have the good contracts in places. But you know, this is why we we launch businesses. There's no preparation ahead of time for it, right, Everett? No. And no. so you got to dive in and have these experiences. And I know a lot of founders are shaking their heads right now going, oh boy, I lost 50K on my developer and, and mm -hmm. got nothing for it. That's and right. that's why here at the Startup Life Live Show, we're always talking about how, you know, to prove your, your MVP. But we actually have documents that we can share with you that will take you through a nice slideshow to help you understand how to onboard a developer, whether it's mm -hmm. bringing them in-house and leading them, even though you're clueless about technology or you do something offshore, the important questions and the legal documents that you want to have in place. So Everett, I'm so happy you brought that up. Mm. Now, you went from there to participating in Women's 2.0's Founder Lab. Talk right. a little bit about that. So shout out to Shaharo Sharanya, who started Women 2.0 in the Founder Lab. Women on 2.0 is a network of bringing together women entrepreneurs and leaders. Uh, and Founder Lab was uh, her attempt to kind of focus on the pre-team, pre-idea founding experience. So you have Y Combinator and um, tech stars who often had teams and they would take you through a process. She was going even earlier. I thought it was a great opportunity for me to take some of those lessons and really uh, put it into practice. So I signed up uh, almost exactly a decade ago. It was December of 2000, um, 2011. Wow. And um, it was an amazing experience. One, I learned what customer development was and learned that basically I've been doing that all my life, but I didn't have a, a word for it. And um, really about trying to understand what a customer's challenges are, what opportunities they're looking for, not just functionally or transactionally, but emotionally. What is the feeling that they have when they're trying to use your product? Um, and then being able to um, quickly get mentor uh, to get mentorship to learn how to quickly iterate. That was the second really big thing. Yeah. Um, and so I can talk a little bit more about the experience of customer development, but um, it really fired me up and said, hey, um, what we came up with was a calendar app for uh, 
for uh, for EAs. And it won the competition, and you know, we started to. I started to think about, hmm, maybe I should keep going with this. And so, how did that lead to co-founding trusts? Because, yeah. So, um, in a combination of stories, you'll probably hear echoes of this. Um, I knew I wanted. I knew there was something to using time better. I also knew that I was not going to found a company without a solid technical co-founder. Why? Because I'd been burned before. Yeah. So I was willing to sit it out. Um, and so I kept looking for five months. And then I heard through the grapevine that my old Linden Lab colleague, Mark Perlot, was leaving Linden Lab. He was on the AIDS ride from San Francisco to LA. I also knew that I probably had hours of him being known to be free before he gets snapped up by somebody else. So I left him a message on a Sunday when he was getting back. We met on Tuesday and I pitched the idea of a, a calendar app but really I pitched the idea of a problem to solve. How do you take unstructured data in a calendar and put it in a structured data that is useful for people, that enables them to manage their time and attention? He said, that sounds pretty cool. So we decided to start working on it. Oh my gosh, and, and structuring information, I can just see your engineer brain going, <laughs> taking that and not sure how all those parts and pieces would work with technology, but knowing enough that this was a problem that would really enhance people's lives. Yeah. And, and go, ahead. go ahead, please. Oh, no, I was just going to say, and then what happened? But I, I also wanted to bring up, too, that you got on the phone and found just this is one of the most important jobs that you mm -hmm. have, roles that you have, which is to get someone excited about your vision so that they'll choose you to come on board with, even though it might be a really skinny salary, because they know that the experience and the outcome is going to light them up. Yeah. And I'm really glad you said those themes because there's the, I'm going to try and get you to, to join my idea, but it has to be in other people's language. If it was about my business language, that's not necessarily appealing to somebody who's really interested in solving technology problems. I had to think about what is the way that that's appealing to somebody who's an engineer. Second thing is, I know my own limitations. I might be an engineer by degree, but that taught me that I am not a born engineer. I don't have the pattern recognition. I have other pattern recognition. So how do I create a team where both of us really are partnered and then can cover more of the bases? Um, and then I think third was um, to get people excited about the outcome. So there's problems to solve, but what's the outcome? We could maybe do this and we could maybe do that. Um, and that focus on outcomes has served us well over the entire uh, entire company. And, uh, excuse me. And obviously it's changed since then. Right. And we'll talk about later, but uh, those are just, really important. Yeah. Things. Such people. important things when we're doing team acquisition, folks. And tell me about Jen. How did she get involved? The other co-founder. So, yeah. So Jen used to work for Mark at Linden Lab. Great. As we were developing this app, it was called Tetherpad. She said, hey, this sounds really cool. Can I join in? And um, uh, she was on her way out. And we said, yeah, sure. I mean, she's really, really good. I mean, both of them are extraordinary engineers, by the way, and extraordinary people. Um, and so the three of us started working together. And then eventually we released our product and um, said that, uh, should we bring her on as a co-founder? Um, we decided to, and just at that time, um, she said, well, my husband actually got a fellowship which is gonna take him across the Balkans in Europe and all the way to Scotland for the next 18 months. Do you think we can work that out? Virtual? And Remote? so we were like, uh, sure, let's figure that out. We've all worked at a virtual reality company. So we had some experience there. Um, so we basically, at that moment, was our first moment of going all remote. So we managed the startup process remotely, and our basically our criteria was you have to have a place that has good Wi-Fi. We make our work transparent, no matter where we are, and yeah, asynchronously. Yeah. And third, when we do meet in person, be on time. And wash, rinse, repeat, That's and we started to build the infrastructure around what we're still doing today and is much better by adding from all the other people. But that was really the origin of how we started to manage the company. What I, what love, I love, and I know and the, I echo, the is echo is back, back Asia. Asia. Um, um, technology. I don't know what to do, do about do. this. Um, the, the, the beauty of what you 
are doing is that you come, you came up with a problem that you wanted to solve, Everett, and that the team pulled together and it started off, you know, structuring a calendar in a way that made sense and made it easier, especially for a really busy executive assistants who were managing some high profile people who had a lot going on and it would make sense to them. But then it led into other structural benefits, right? And and this is, and folks, this is just, this happens to founders all the time. They start pulling on threads, they start follow, uh, solving problems, and that core problem that they have figured out can be expanded in so many different ways. How did you and the team, not, it sounded almost, almost like you had a little pivot along the way, and you've continued to pivot along the way. Yeah, so. Um, and reiterate in different yeah. ways. Yeah, so Tetherpad, we were thinking, okay, let's go out and raise some money for this. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of calendar apps that started to show up. And we weren't really feeling like the growth we had was gonna be warranting a uh, venture capital fund. Now I'll say, we'd all been part of one of those fast growing startups. Linden Lab, maker of Second Life, for those of you who didn't know Linden Lab at Second Life, was the darling of the tech press, probably from 2005 to 2008 or nine. Um, but we also saw the impact of having it be over leveraged. And so while it was a very successful, profitable business, it wasn't going public immediately. And so there's some challenges with that. Right. So we were trying to really assess whether or not it made sense for us to raise capital. In the meantime, by the way, we're not paying ourselves. This is after about a year. And a friend of ours, also from Linden Lab, said, hey, you all do really good work. I have a problem I want to solve. Do you think you can help us? Um, and so we did. Nice. And we did it because we said, let's take that and bank about $200,000. And that's going to be our venture funding. And we keep control. We can figure out what we want to do. Maybe there's a shift in the market. And that was really the first pivot towards what trust became. Love. And then the second pivot was... Um, on a Sunday in 2013, um, I get a call from Mark, uh, at 7 PM. As you all know, at 7 PM on a Sunday, if you get a call from your co-founder, it's not good okay. news. <laughs> so, um, so I got that call and he said, Everett, uh, the secretary, the, sorry, the, the CTO of the United States wants me to go work on healthcare.gov. And I think I said, you got to go. And he says, yeah, I got to go. And I said, when you got to leave? Tuesday. Okay, Jen and I will figure it out. That was it. It was about a 90 second conversation. Wow. And that turned into him being part of that amazing team. Yeah. And then being asked back as a company, I said, hey, you all are good at this. Can you do more? So we wound up building the second healthcare.gov, the next iteration, and we hired a bunch of people to do that. And that's how trust actually has in its present form. I spent the summer figuring out whether, should we do this while everybody else is building? <laughs> and eventually we got to the point where, hey, we can actually hire full-time people, hire really great people, have a big impact, and have a big impact at scale. Small little company we were able, along with others, so we didn't, I'm not taking all the credit that we shared this with a lot of other people. Over 20, 20 million people now have healthcare or access to healthcare because of the work we did. And so that was a really high alignment between all of us. And it was really important to get that done. But we were teeny tiny. And so it feels really good to be part of that. Absolutely. First of all, kudos to Mark, you know, for getting the call and having a reputation where, you know, he would be called. And then back to you in the beginning, kudos for having someone like Mark as a co-founder, yeah. but also to the team just going, dude, we've got this, you know, yeah. go make it happen. This is important. This is a calling. You must go. And then seeing and, and really crunching the numbers, folks, when you go on to take something on that's much bigger than you had yet evolved into, that does take some thinking time, Everett. And I love that you guys processed what would that look like? What would the burden be on right. us? Um, but at the same time, the reward, getting 20 million people on health insurance is significant and so huge. And the impact is so huge. And I bet that started to light you up as to, you know, even more about how do we 
help more people right. in the world in all sorts of areas. And so I'd love to talk a, a little bit more about how all of this worked into your getting so lit up about reducing the bias mm -hmm. of bringing folks into tech, because mm -hmm. I'm sure you had your experiences as a black tech co-founder and how you started to educate yourself on what the biases are, right. unconscious or conscious. Mm -hmm. And then how does one bring in more diversity? Because folks, look, tech jobs pay really well. Mm -hmm. And we need more of our people, our diverse people, to get the opportunity to be trained and then be hired into these roles where they can succeed like your mom and dad did. Right. Thanks to IBM's initiative. Let's talk a little bit about that because I'm fascinated. Uh, you know, we, I talk about this all the time, of course, yeah. about diversity, but I'm, I love that you are an infrastructuralist mm -hmm. and I'm going to have you explain that as well. And that you really understand how to change because so much talk happens and not right. enough change happens. Yeah. So, so multi-layered question. Um, so where I'll start is, first of all, I'm a black CEO. We have a white technical female uh, tech lead who is now our COO, Jen, and Mark, white male CTO. So right up the front, we don't look like the standard, the standard startup team. That doesn't mean the right startup team, the standard startup team. So we wanted to make diversity and inclusion central to how we set up the business. And central means not just the value, but also understanding how it connects with the business and the business model. Because so many folks, especially in the last year or so after George Floyd and so forth, talked about diversity, equity, inclusion. And the danger is it's a side project. And so I would ask when I was getting, um, I would ask, uh, I'm sorry, when people ask me, well, how do I set this up? I said, well, what's your outcome that you want to have? Do you want to have a diverse company? Do you want to help a lot of people? Do you want to set up a training program? But more importantly, how does it affect your business? How's it going to make you a better uh, company? How's it going to improve your products? How's it going to improve your services? Why do I say that? Because if it's a side project that goes, that has a little bit of budget, a little bit of initiative, and you send some people in a committee to go do it, guess what? When business turns down, when budgets are tight, what's the first thing that's going to get cut? It has to be central to the business and central to the business model. So that's what we did. We said, okay, first, we're a small company. We can't compete with the Fang or now it's Manga companies, the Googles, the Facebooks or whatever by handing people paycheck, uh, huge paychecks. What we can do is create a new type of environment that creates psychological safety for women engineers where a lot of people do not creating a space for black and brown people to be able to thrive and do great work. So we put that in our values right up front. And by doing so, and then enacting them from the beginning, we were able to attract more people and more people and then reflect back those values to further people and further people. Many people don't want to say, oh, we'll do the diversity afterwards. No, when you're 30 people and you have basically only one group of folks, it is so much harder to attract new folks because why? They don't take you seriously. Do the diversity up front, create certain values up front and connect it to your business model up front. You're going to be so much further ahead. What happens? Because I hear this, I'm in Boston. And what I have heard is, oh, we wanted to bring in a woman or we wanted to bring in a person of color, but oh, this guy was available. So I grabbed him. Uh, so <laughs> my answer, it, it, it's real. Okay. You know, glibness aside, mm -hmm. that's real. And for me, what's going to prevent that from happening over and over again? That is a decision that has implications. Yes. A different way to look at it is before you need to hire those people, what are you trying to do? And this is a long-term strategy. So build networks, not just networks transactionally, what we did was say, we got to start creating relationships with folks. So I would go attend women technology meetups. 
I'd be, I've been speakers at women only events. I started the company with women 2.0. <laughs> Why? Because I was building relationships that I was adding to their network that maybe eventually they would trust me to say, Hey, maybe can I put this job description on your network? It's not transaction, it's relationships. The same goes for hiring um, people of color, um, LGBTQA. Yeah. And so think and of it as a three year strategy because that's how long it takes. Yeah, the disability person, absolutely. Like, I don't know what it's like, but I can be in relationship with people long enough so that I can start to understand and start to reflect that back. If I can do that successfully and they give me critique, like I've gotten it wrong plenty of time, but eventually it's like, oh wait, he's gonna listen to me? Cool, I will send this person to your company as a real, he's a great, or she's a great engineer and has some disability issues. But I think there's a place that that person can thrive yeah, because of sure. the relationships. And add, you know, to the canvas folks. Absolutely. One thing that Everett said that is so important, I really want you to take this in, um, my family of whites out there, you know, he talks about, Everett's talking about building your network, increasing the type of uh, threads in your fabric, so to speak, because if you have it in one category, you're not going to be able to find that person because that you want to bring in because it's not in your network. That's why it's so important, whether it's LinkedIn or going to the events in person when we can, to start meeting diverse folks and adding them to your network so that when you have a call as a founder to bring somebody on with a certain skill set, you're not seeing the same old, same old crop up. You're taking a uh, concerted effort. It's a strategy to make sure. And, and I always talk about here in Boston, what happened here was uh, the government was like, well, we'd hire these black owned businesses, but we don't, we can't find them anywhere. I should have done that in a Boston accent. We can't find them anywhere. Yeah. And so the Black <laughs> Economic Council put together a wonderful event and filled the Boston Convention Center and said, here you go. Right. <laughs> we right. have them here in Massachusetts for our city. They can do and help the state, the Commonwealth. It's the same thing, folks. If you are just in a homogenous environment, you're not going to branch out and see the diversity and not just for you know people of color, but for other abled, for LGBTQ plus. And sure, you're not going to sit there and go, "Are you gay?" You know, are you, are you a member of the community? But folks, when they feel safe with you, are going to be able to say, "I'm a member of the LGBTQ plus community." And the other thing, I had a quick question for you because it really resonated with me when you said, "I want the women engineers to feel." psychologically safe. Mm -hmm. I have never really heard anybody express that before. Maybe listeners you have, I have not in the engineering environment, which we know can be very misogynistic mm -hmm. and bro culture-y. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Talk a um, little bit about that. What yeah. Does that so, what does that look like having something psychologically safe? Well, it's one of my favorite concepts, Amy Edmondson, uh, for those of you who don't know, the person whose research came up with that and, you know, is named as psychological safety. And it's it's um, it's really a foundation that enables people to thrive. Do you have an environment where people feel like they can speak up? Do they have an environment where people can critique? Do you have an environment where there's a fluid um, uh, passage of communication and information among all groups, or is it occluded in some places? There's a lot of different aspects to it, and I encourage folks to, to sort of dig in um, because I'm by no means am the expert, but in terms of trying to do it at, at trust and, in, and with our clients, it's really about trying to create those communication patterns where people feel comfortable adding their voice. So in, a, um, in some practical ways, if you're leading a meeting and you notice people, certain people haven't spoken up, you have an opportunity to stop and say, hey, I haven't heard you uh, talk. Is there something that you want to add to this? Um, they can decline or not, but it's recognizing that certain people aren't speaking and maybe creating a platform for that. Right. I think a second one is psychological safety is when there's a mistake um, somewhere, how do you handle that? You say, uh, no, it's not me. It's not me. It's not or say, oh, you know what? Thanks for bringing it up. I'll see if we can do better. 
because we all have wobbles, right? Right. That creates some safety and some trust. And we're not perfect at by no means. <laughs> it is an ongoing get 1% better every day type of a situation. But the value of it is that you create a culture and, and uh, relationships with people that creates trust. With a lot of trust, you can do really great things. Um, so that's, oh, let me and, tell you one, one other oh, quick, yeah, do. Oh, quick story. Um, uh, we hired our first uh, trans person a couple of years ago. And within, I think, a couple of weeks, she said, hey, you know what? No one has pronouns as part of their uh, their their Slack um, Slack name or their Zoom name. I'd like to suggest that we put those on there. That's important. Now that wasn't important to me personally, and I was like, oh, I don't know if this is going to make a difference. With it. Great, that's awesome. This person felt compelled to do that as a new employee, and so we all did it. It was great, and um, within. I'm sorry, the next three hires that we had during the recruiting session, I was the last person that was the interview. Three people, none of whom were non-binary, said, you know what? I really appreciate that you all had your pronouns on your Zoom chat. This is, again, this was a couple of years ago. Because I knew that if, if you could make it safe for people to put their pronouns, it was safe enough for me with whoever I am to be at this company. I heard it once, it was one thing, but when you hear it three times, it's like, oh, now I get it. Yeah. Um, that gesture had an impact, not just on the people themselves, that person, the group themselves, but had an impact on the entire company. That for me is the combination of initiative that creates psychological safety as an organization. So that in a very practical way, that's how it manifested. That's a powerful story. And thank you so much. I kind of teared up mm -hmm. when you told that story. Because it's so important, you know, where you know, companies, you know, don't make the mistake of thinking you're a family, you're a team, and the team has to be able to trust each other in order to bring out the best outcome, in order to bring out their best uh, capability and ability and their gifts. And that trust is huge. And I, I remember as we, uh, I earned my MBA in 89, and it was something that we talked a lot about back then that in this 21st century, it was going to be about trust and mm -hmm. how people made decisions in uh, choosing an organization. And you just demonstrated that. And that yeah. is beautiful. Thank you for that outstanding example. Um, I also, you know, this word is, and I, you know, I don't know where I've been, but I, I kind of understand it when I read it, but I would love to learn more about ethnography. Mm. Yeah. And I'm even saying it correctly. Yeah, it is. Um, so, my uh, sort of version of what ethnography is, is basically being able to understand and go and study different groups of people who have distinct uh, common cultures, processes, et cetera, et cetera. And it can, it's a fairly broad uh, field. I actually, it was close to being a ethno ethnomusicologist because I was really interested in protest music in um in Brazil, in the samba, when people are dancing around, they'd often put little jabs at the government. And I was just very curious about that because it happens in Cuba and other places. Um, but where it fits into business is um, you're really observing, listening, reflecting, and trying to understand over time uh, how people sort of interact with each other that may be the same or distinct as other folks. It becomes really important from a perspective of customers, yeah. where you're trying to understand, there's an ethnography of CEOs. There's an ethnography of senior technology people. There's an ethnot, you know, yeah. you get into that cultural aspect. If you think about it that way, it becomes a very interesting ability to do research and design to reflect the cultures that you're trying to serve or trying to work with. And so we have a thing at Trust we call design, uh, discovery and framing. And a lot of it is using these techniques to understand the needs of our, our clients, the needs of their clients, and the needs of people who are operating the system. So uh, you know, being able to do this work with our clients becomes actually a skill set that we have, we have a lot of expertise, far better than I personally. 
Oh, absolutely. When you think about the bridge that is created, when you're able to speak language, and Stephen Covey talked about this, of course, is that when you know you when you can really be understanding of the person you're trying to reach, your communication, first you can resonate back to them, what they're used to hearing and seeing, and then you create this lovely bridge into whether it's buying or mm -hmm. connecting or team acquisition or customer acquisition. Right. It is so, so important. And I have a question around that, but I wanna bring up Asia's comment, which is, I love the concept of psychological safety. Seems to be a way to improve culture from a personal level to across the organization. That's so true, Asia. And you know, Everett, as women, okay, well, I'm not an engineer, but I know what my sisters go through, mm -hmm. but I am heavily entrenched in the startup culture. I'd like to chat a little bit about what women are facing right now with the bro culture. That's an mm -hmm. ethnography, right? Yes. There's a language, there's a presence, but what I think um, these wonderful men aren't seeing is the embedded misogyny and some mm -hmm. of the language they're using. Can we talk a little bit about that? What are your insights from that and how we can be better founders yeah. and you know, women founders in helping raising the consciousness of the men as well. Yeah, so um, again, multi-layered question. I'll take two little pieces of it. Um, one piece is one of, the, one of the things that has emerged in people studying office culture, which is in some ways in the startup world has evolved into sort of the bro-y culture, the drinking and the so forth and so on, is that the open office culture often didn't work for women. Why? If you're the only woman in a, a group of men, every day you walk by a bunch of folks and there's some like looks or whatever, whatever, that doesn't make you feel real good when you sit down and start your day. And then you got the rest of your day to have to deal with folks here and there. Um, that happens to a lot of people, but one of the things that the study, and I wish I could cite the specifics, was saying that that actually had a big impact on women being able to do the work be great at what they did and being able to express their their creativity and their talent. The open office culture was one of those things that was promulgated as the way to go. Right. The benefit yeah. of the pandemic yeah. in some ways. I mean, by the way, we're remote first. So we've been remote. We have 125 people all across the country, all remote. Beautiful. So people didn't have to worry about that. And so they could focus just on doing their job. Yeah. That's a big be benefit. Um, now, as people are thinking about remote work, I think there's a lot of new opportunities for women. By the way, of course, there's a limitation in that a lot of women who are caretakers are stretching the boundaries of their day and it's kind of including into work. So I want to be clear about acknowledging that. That's another thing that we have to work with. That's right. But the bro culture of the office becomes now a lot less impactful. So that's one story. Um, quick other story. Uh, how do you do something about it? So one day um, we were around a com uh, we were we were about twenty five people, and we were having an all hands kind of meeting. And one of the women said, "Hey, you know what? I noticed that we use guys a lot when we say you guys, like when you're addressing a, a group of people." And she says, "I do it too, but I'd like us not to do that anymore." We're like, "Yeah, okay, fair play." Um, somebody said, "Hey." I got an idea. So they developed a bot on Slack. And it was originally from the gov.uk and we adapted it for ourselves. And what it did was if anybody wrote guys, the bot would automatically to that person say, uh, do you mean y'all? Do you mean you all? Do you mean uh, the dearly, uh, the, the, the aforementioned gathered? And there were some really, really hilarious um, things. And um, what it did was you got immediate feedback, right? Oh, crap, I didn't mean that. Two, it was funny. Yeah. And it didn't make you feel shamed. It just pointed out, eh, you could use another word. Uh, and three, it was democratic. It didn't matter who had encountered it. Everybody got the same experience. The use of guys went plummeted within months. So there's little things that you can tweak. It doesn't have to be a big initiative. There's little yeah. things to tweak to help people realize the unconscious bias that they're uh, they're. Everett, you have no idea how helpful you've been right hmm. now just sharing this because 
so many women are struggling. We went through this in the 80s as we tried to get into finance and legal and, and right. really uh, health care and, and in really senior C-suite roles was this whole thing. We got to be part of the guys. Yeah. And and we struggled with that and we worked on, you know, we wore the like little tie like <laughs> blue navy blue suits and all yeah, this yeah. stuff trying to fit in it was a disaster and <laughs> yep, i went to an all women's mean. mba program and whereas the first time we had case studies of women in leadership positions right? right and so we talked a lot about this how do you keep your femininity how do you stay a woman when everybody's got to go play golf and you hate golf or yeah, you yeah, hate yeah. beer that's right and and so trent you know fast forwarding 30 years and as someone who co-hosts a pitch event here in Boston for over three years, you know, first mostly in person and then over the last year virtual, I see our younger women who are raised with a little bit more egalitarianism right. than we were. All of a sudden they're thinking to be part of the startup culture, they need to be bros too. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're not feeling good. They're not feeling comfortable because of the embedded misogyny. And so I, I can't begin to thank you for sharing this way of diluting that and helping us understand that that open office thing, absolutely. And you know women out there who have been in fields where it's ma majority male mm -hmm. and you're in there and you know, guys are going to talk the way they're talking. I'm not talking locker room talk. It's just mm -hmm. no, but they're going to be like, dude, and they like to, you know, put each other down you know, women don't do that. That's not their game. And so I love that you talked about this and I know you're, I'm going to be sharing this far and wide. <laughs> mm, good, good, good. good. And, credit, credit to the folks at trust. It's not, not my idea. It's, and that was the best part about it. It came from folks who oh, felt like it could be and, created. And you and I know humor is what opens doors, right? Mm -hmm. Because it does take away the shame. Hey, Renee, I'm like fist bumping with you, right? That's just such great advice. And Asia K, the bot idea is amazing. What a great way to use AI to filter unneeded language that can hinder productivity and well-being really, really good. So thank you for diving deep into that with me. Where, like, what is this passion that you are having right now in reducing, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier in reducing the bias and, mm -hmm. and all, how did you know to do these studies? I mean, you've shared some wonderful stories with us today, but how did you know and have the passion and the drive to go deeper into solving this problem and coming up with actual concrete things that companies can do? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's because, uh, going back to the original story, there's a lot of people who have a lot to offer in the world and don't ever get access or right. opportunity, or if they do get opportunity, they're shunted to one side or the other. So personally, it was important to me too. I thought, look, the studies are there when you have diverse teams developing products, yeah. you have better solutions, not just diversity in terms of race, ethnicity, or gender, or sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera, but in terms of ways of thinking, um, all of those things, diversity is really important. So I think that at core is the passion. Yeah. So, and how are you implementing and executing? What is an infrastructuralist and how is that serving you in implementing and executing? Because I'm just seeing a bunch of talk in the last 12 months mm -hmm. and not enough evidence of actual implementation. Sure, sure, sure. So this is going to be an opportunity to talk about infrastructuralism, but actually it's sort of evolved since since then. Infrastructure, the way we think about it, is the interaction between people, operations, and technology. So it's not just technology, it's the interaction between all those. It's a way of thinking about systems. So when we think about things like uh, companies, that's a system. When you think about big technology projects, those are systems. But we also now have things like the pandemic. That is a systems problem, right? Um, it's the interaction between all these pieces and that's why it's part of it. Now it's a global problem. Right. Um, these systems and these complex systems for me are the problem of the 21st century. We are living in a complex systems world, but we're trained in something that is very sort of rigid or what we call in the complexity science they call complicated where it's linear well understood problems so anybody knows what the what the solution is to the pandemic let me know um it's complex similarly we have the fires 
forest fires all over California. We have climate change. Diversity and inclusion after um, George Floyd, also highly complex problem. I think for me, what has come about now is last year I was inspired to uh, take this infrastructuralism idea and turn it into a book. So it's called Move to the Edge Declared Center. I wrote it all last year. Um, it is uh, coming, it's going to be published by Wiley and it will come out in February of 2022. So Very a lot exciting. of the examples that I talk about during this podcast, I put into a structure that helps people, a framework to help people move through the complexity and uncertainty that comes with today and then create systems, this is the infrastructure part, systems to sustain and scale and share those learnings so that you can share it with your organization, your team, or the rest of your company. Yeah. This is very exciting because, you know, we have, I um, mean, we see this in our journalism as well, but in the reporting, everybody loves talking about the problem, right? And that we need to find a solution. You have the solution. You're giving everybody the roadmap that they need to make this implementation so that they can succeed within their organization. And, and just, uh, I think it was Wednesday, I listened in, tuned in to SNAP's big diversity summit they had. Oh mm -hmm. my gosh, you know, to hear some of the leaders of some of these companies being really committed and how important ag hashtag action speaks is at the same time, I wondered, you know, where are the results? And I think the beauty of what you're doing and the work that you're doing, Everett, and the book, I can't wait to read it, is it's going to give everybody the guide, you know, yeah. that they need. The, it's a framework. Um, it's a framework for helping people think about it, for sure. It, absolutely. Because, again, we're dealing with centuries of bias, oh, yeah. unconscious or otherwise, and it is a complicated uh, problem. Hey, Suzette, yes, that bot idea is cool. Should be built out to tackle other <laughs> issues with oh, language. Hey, Suzette. I didn't. Yeah. I, I, yes, Suzette. Yay. Yay, Suzette. Um, and thank you, Renee. It is a wonderful talk. I could listen to Everett all day. And um, what last thing would you like us to know about diversity? You know, the, the play that mm. needs to happen so that we bring more into our fabric and we get rid of this bias called, oh, affirmative action. Mm -hmm. No, that's got to be erased and put away. What yeah. we're doing is, is that, and your parents, it's just like, it was just a beacon for where you are today, right? You know, how mm -hmm. they moved in and they had the opportunity this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring in more diverse team folk because when you have diversity, you're going to have better customer service. You're going to have a better team. You're going to have a better outcome. Right. What would you like us to know? What's really important for us to yeah. take away today? One, start today. Two, you're going to make mistakes. Be okay with that. No matter what you do, you're going to mess it up a little bit. Keep going. Three, measure your outcomes. Decide what you want to, what standard you want to hit, and then measure towards that. And then four, I think I said earlier, make sure it's connected to your business. If it's a side project, my belief it will fail. If it's central to your organization, it then becomes part of your natural system. And then five, this is hard work. Take care of yourselves. Sustain, do the things you need to do to sustain your effort. It's not gonna go away through, you know, the sprint, not, it's not a marathon, sorry, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. If anything in the pandemic has happened is we, we've had to learn how to go through uh, so many challenges and being able to sustain our effort through those challenges is a really important thing that we can do to really make a difference with bringing more diverse people into our companies and enabling everybody to thrive. It's a skill set, folks, and it's a practice. And as Maya, absolutely, and as, as Maya Angelus, <laughs> Angelus says, once you know better, you do better. Yeah, <laughs> good, 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 good. I love that. Yeah, something I tell my kids all the time. Mm. <laughs> but I, I just want everybody to know I have had this anti delicious moment the entire conversation. <laughs> I, I could have been pressing that the whole time. I mean, every single thoughtful piece of advice and insight and solution that you shared today, Everett. So wonderful. Let's talk a little bit. Let's put your founder hat back on, your co-founder hat, your entrepreneurship hat on, and talk about shifting mindsets because there's a lot of responsibility that happens for founders. 
they reach, they can reach some plateaus that get really scary, or they can be really excited. They just raised, you know, a series A of a hundred million, but all of a sudden now they've got investors breathing down their throats and, oh my gosh, what have I done? You know, this is a really complex world we live in as founders. And there's a lot of ups and downs. Uh, one minute we're popping mm -hmm. the champagne and we're crying into it. What have you learned when you have faced founder doubt and insecurity along the way? What has helped you the most in shifting out of that that other founders could learn from? My experience has been, it's a daily experience of not knowing something. So getting comfortable with being uncomfortable is a really important practice because as a CEO, as a founder, you'll encounter things that are like, what am I supposed to do with this? Second, um, how I sort of transferred is um, understanding that there are a lot of people who are willing to help. So I learned, lean on, you know, podcasts like this, other founders who are just a little bit ahead of me, who can tell me here's what's not in the headlines. Um, and then I think the others is really about frankly, an interior practice. I've had a 25 year meditation practice, which helps me kind of be present and able to hear different things, even when things are complex and uncertain and fraught. Um, I think finally, I mean, there's lots of things I can say is keeping curious and learning and having a lot of humility um, because you're going to be humbled at some point in time. You might as well just start practicing now. <laughs> <laughs> your, your mistakes become like under spotlights, everybody. That's but right. the one thing that you said that really is something I'm going to have stitch on a pillow <laughs> is get comfortable with being uncomfortable founders. And you may feel like, how am I ever going to get comfortable? Believe me, you are building a muscle. You're building a tolerance yes. level of uncertainty. And you're going to get <clears throat> much better with the fact of staying curious so that you're not taking it always personally. You're able to look at it as it, like it's a science experiment and going, oh my gosh, that didn't work at all. All right, what do we need to fix here? Instead of going, I'm an idiot. That didn't work at all. And so that's such great advice. And meditation, being able to take a breath. Meditation can, you know, be certainly sitting down for 20 minutes or so quietly, but it can also be gardening mm -hmm. or, you know, jigsaw puzzle. It could be, you know, some movement that you do, a walk, you know, whatever that works for you. It calms the mind and the heart and the soul so that you can then show up even more present for your work. Oh, Everett, mm. thank you so much for joining me. I really, you know, your presence, your insight, your deep understanding, but more importantly, your empathy for the challenges and the complexity of what diversity is, taking the history around all of that and taking us into the future and you know, rebuilding our perception is just beautiful. And you have the ideal nature and lived experience to be leading this. And I'm really grateful for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, a, thank you. Thank you, listeners, and for the good questions and comments. And thank Andy for, for creating the space around this and being curious about digging deeper into these questions because uh, uh, I would love to see more of this. And so it gives me an opportunity to share with, with everybody. So I really appreciate the exchange. Uh -huh. of Thank you. Well, I'm a huge fan. My generation, Sly and the Family Stone, you know, mm -hmm. we're all everyday people, you know, yeah. we need to all get along. And this is ways that we can champion each other instead of, you know, hanging out in fear. So I love that you're doing that. I'm going to pop you in the green room, wrap up the show with everybody. If you can stick around, great. I'd love to give you a virtual hug um, as, we, as I close out. But I just cannot thank you enough. I'm going Thank to be much, grabbing lots of clips from today's conversation. Uh, and yes, in Asia, sums it up beautifully. This has been an extremely thoughtful conversation. So glad to have learned from Everett today. Asia's in the tech world. You know, she's a UX person and it's not easy. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to thank you founders and listeners and viewers for tuning in today and grabbing these incredible nuggets and insights and the thoughtful 
pieces of information that our extraordinary guest, Everett Harper, shared with us today. I know that I will be taking it in and re-listening to this many times. And you'll find I'll grab a lot of the clips and share them across social media because it was so, so important. Uh, on Tuesday, let me just share with you what's who's coming up next. The oh-so-wonderful Jacqueline Hampton. She's coming in Tuesday, November 9th at 12 p.m. ET, 9 a.m. PT. She's the founder of Portigo, your ultimate travel organizer that helps you save, plan, and share amazing adventures all in one place. We're going to learn so much from her amazing career because she was serious corporate dev, okay, and how she shifted into entrepreneurship to create this amazing platform in such a crowded world. And how do you know whenever I post a new show? It's because you're going to join the meetup group right here. I just want to remind you one more time, the Startup Life Live meetup group. Come join us. That way you'll get an alert every time I bring another extraordinary guest like our guest today with Everett Harper. And in the meantime, I want to close off with reminding everybody, please, please, please remember, and we talked about this too, please remember that you are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and as we say here in Boston, wicked smarter than you think. <laughs> you can do this. I'm wishing you a glorious and delicious day wherever you're glowing. Thanks again for tuning in. I'll see you next time. Mwahs to all of you.